Hello. Um, Kalispera. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, today we will have um, an English session. We will do this in English because within the panel there are two um, individuals who do not speak Greek and it's an honor to have them. And uh, I would like to introduce this panel and this panel will hold a discussion about how technology can change healthcare. Myself, I'm uh, George Kletzes. I'm uh, leading IQVIA technologies in Greece, Eastern Europe, Russia, and CIS. IQVIA is uh, a services provider in the area of life sciences, in the area of analytics, technology, clinical research. And today with me, I have the honor to have with me Mr. Nico Gariboldi, who is leading the Global Center of Innovation for Pfizer in Thessaloniki. Welcome. I also have the honor to have with me Mr. Spiridon Gikas Panousis, who is the general manager of General Electric Healthcare in Greece and Cyprus. Welcome also. I also have the honor to have with me Mrs. Rezan Kosse, who is the chief operating officer of Intelligentsia. She is here to substitute Mr. Dimitrios Kaltsas, who was not able to participate due to a delay of his flight. Welcome, Mrs. Kosse. Um, I also have the honor to have here with me Mr. Kostas Saridakis, who is the founder of Collaborate Healthcare. And last but not least, I have the honor to have with me here Professor Panagiotis Vlamos, who is leading the Department of Informatics in the Onion University. Welcome, uh, all of you. And if I can just have a couple of minutes to share my thoughts on this very interesting topic. So how technology can help healthcare, can improve, can affect healthcare, how the future will be of um, healthcare through technology. When I'm thinking of technology, um, of healthcare, I'm thinking of a series of processes, administration and management of different actions in order to prevent, improve, heal uh, people's health. And this is very wide and very complex because prevention includes a lot of things. Um, treatment includes other things. Management of those is very, very complex. And technology is always present in this because historically, uh, Healthcare is bound with science, and science has technology within it. Advancements in healthcare came through science and through technology. And this is what we hope all hope for also for the future. And nowadays we know also that technology is disruptive. And the question is: how would technology maybe disrupt healthcare? How would it change it? How can the future be different? Will it be better as we all hope? Will it be Worse, will it be different? And nowadays, if you check on the technology trends, you will see two big trends. One is health tech and the other is fintech. And these are the areas where tons of investment is done. And having said that, I would like to hear um, the honorable members of this panel, uh, their opinion on this topic. So how could technology change healthcare. And maybe we can start with Mr. Gariboldi, who is leading um, the Digital Innovation Center of Pfizer, one of the big farm of the world, who obviously might have an opinion on that. Mr. Gariboldi. Thanks, George. Thanks uh, for the invitation uh, at this uh, important event. I'm really happy to be here with this panel. Uh, I think this is a very good question. So first of all, let me give only to you a little bit of background on the Center for Digital Innovation, because this is, as you said, it's a global, uh, it's a global center for digital that Pfizer uh, decided uh, to develop and set up here uh, in Thessaloniki. It's the only one globally for Pfizer, and we are really proud that uh, we hired already 400 uh, talented people across all the different capabilities uh, here in Thessaloniki. I think... Uh, it's impacting uh, hugely, I would say, healthcare, because uh, if I think especially about uh, our company, so as you know very well, uh, it's a pharma, the pharma that developed also the vaccine. I think that the way that we are working and also engaging with all the stakeholders from patients to physicians is changing, is changing a lot. So let me give you 
uh, some example, for example, from our company. So for example, if you think about uh, drug discovery, so drug discovery is really impacted a lot uh, by digital. So for example, uh, if you think uh, about uh, supercomputing or quantum computing, this is a way that we are really leveraging a lot digital uh, for accelerating and making even more effective the, the drug uh, discovery. So this is a very important piece for Pfizer. So we are testing uh, virtually in virtual lab, uh, I would say some molecules that could come uh, then to the market and this is accelerating uh, enormously this process. So, but this is only one example, but also for example, if you think uh, about the way that uh, pharma and our company is interacting with stakeholders, so with patients, physicians, we are not only providing uh, drugs and vaccine that for sure are the most important one, but we are also providing solutions for managing better the disease, for making a connection of physician uh, with patients. So these are really things that are impacting and changing and making better also the healthcare sector. So another example that I want to take to the table that for me, it's really important and it's connected also with the COVID-19 vaccine. So also think about drug development. So drug development, one of the most important uh, piece uh, it's uh, making clinical trials. So the clinical trials that Pfizer did uh, for COVID-19 vaccine included more or less 45,000 patients. So thanks to digital, uh, we were able to manage this virtually, remotely. And this is, I would say, a very important piece because as you can imagine, especially under pandemic, it was not easy to move uh, to the different, uh, I would say, offices for uh, meeting the physicians, uh, for uh, providing information. So this is the first piece, but also if you think about data, so the data that for clinical trials uh, is the most important piece, uh, the most also costly part of clinical trials. Thanks to digital, we can uh, manage better data. So in terms of accuracy, we can collect better data and we can make even better analysis. So I think these are only some examples uh, from uh, a company perspective, but this is impacting all the sector uh, in general, as I said. Also, if you think uh, about digital solution, uh, digital therapeutics, uh, these are really, I would say, and also the management of data of patients through digital, this, everything has been impacted and will be impacted by digital. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Nico. Thank you very much. I, uh, I know some of these cases that you mentioned because I know also that IQV helped a lot in the clinical research of uh, the COVID-19 vaccine, and this is uh, great. So uh, jumping from uh, a big pharma representative to a big medical technology <laughs> representative, uh, Mr. Gikas, you are the general manager of General Electric, one of you know, uh, well-respected and well-established and for hundreds of years giving technology solutions to serve healthcare. How do you see healthcare um, evolve through the use of technology? And I know I'm asking people who really are in the heart of technology in healthcare. First of all, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, you know, the, as you you said very well, we are a medical technology company, so we love to discuss about technology in, in healthcare. This is what we do daily. In fact, General Electric, as you said, is one of the leading medical technology and diagnostic innovator globally. We have a, a history of 130 years. This is the year we celebrate uh, 130 years uh, as, as a company invented by Thomas Edison. So with all this long history that the healthcare has, in order to to remain uh, live in this uh, domain, all we do is to innovate every day. And in fact, as uh, it was said just now, uh, now with the, the occasion of the pandemic, we had the opportunity to see how we can move faster. So the pandemic uh, acted as an accelerator in many things towards innovation and, and disruption. And, and one of those areas uh, was to see, as it was said, the digital impact that uh, we can have in technology in doing things faster and better, but, but also the way we are moving is towards what we say, what we call precision health, which is an approach to care that it is integrated, more efficient and highly personalized to each patient. Now, in our, in our technology, in potentially many of us have the experience of uh, an ultrasound uh, scan and a CT scan and a mass scan, but during the pandemic, 
several of our uh, of people have been treating to our uh, ventilators or monitoring systems. And we don't feel that, but all those machines are smart devices. And in many occasions, they were able to support uh, individuals in, in ways that uh, were really personalized. Now we realize that we, we, this is the right way, this is the right approach we should be taking for different reasons. One, obviously, is the clinical efficiency, the clinical excellence, in order to be more precise and avoid the, the waste of time or, um, uh, or, uh, any, uh, or to increase the diagnostic confidence. The other reason is to, 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 to address the financial constraints because the healthcare cost is rising. So we need to find ways to, 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 to become more efficient and more, more productive. So the way innovation is taking is to have more personalized, more targeted um, approach to technology, and at the same time to become more operationally efficient. And this is the path that also in, uh, in our industry and in our organization we are taking. Great, thank you, thank you very much. And you, you said the word operational efficiency, the term. And uh, before uh, Nico was talking about clinical trials. And having said that, I would like also Mrs. Cosse opinion on those, who is the chief operating officer of Intelligentsia, uh, a very very successful startup, which is Greek U.S. Greek startup. Um, to talk us about her view on that, given also the fact that Intelligentsia is focusing on improving clinical trials with maximum operational efficiency. So with less investment, do better and smarter clinical trials. So uh, Mrs. Cosset, what do you think about this? And since you are, let's say, in the tip of the spear of the, let's say, revolution of health through use of technology, analytics, and AI. Of course, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be here in the great company, in the company of great minds. Uh, I'm already inspired by the fellow panelists as well as the participants. Um, so what Intelligentsia does is uh, we are a technology company, exactly to your point. We are at the intersection of healthcare and uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, we believe that we pioneered the use of AI in assessing and addressing the fundamental risk that's inherent in drug development. And our goal is to maximize the odds of multiple life-changing therapies uh, going forward. And Pfizer, with the uh, COVID example, uh, was an excellent proof of it could actually be done in a shorter frame of time, uh, etc. And to your opening statement, George, exactly what we want to see is a positive disruption and a paradigm shift in the space. One day we wanna be able to look back and say how it was extremely risky. Uh, it was taking insurmountable amount of you know, cost and time to develop uh, novel therapies and new uh, drugs for the patients. So we would like to all of us together, uh, you know, pioneer and lead the change here uh, with the power of uh, massive amounts of data uh, as well as the data science. Uh, the way we are approaching this is, um, according to the research, uh, the time to bring a target from discovery to market, it takes about a decade. Uh, it takes about 1.3 billion to 2.1 billion, which is staggeringly expensive. Um, and this was exactly the impetus of our uh, company's beginning at the end of 2017. Uh, how can we use uh, the you know, amount of data that's available now uh, by using the artificial intelligence to address this massive amount of uh, time and cost investment in the clinical development space. Uh, so that's kind of uh, the road that we are on right now. Uh, we believe that it can be done. Um, uh, what we have uh, been using more specifically is uh, we have machine learning algorithms using our proprietary data that are expertly created. Uh, and more technically, we assess the probability and uh, probability of technical and regulatory success. And we believe that by doing so, uh, we can help pharmaceutical companies and biotechs to make better decisions uh, that are backed by data as opposed to previous brick and mortar and people models. 
uh, put their bets on highly likely um, uh, you know, experiments and programs, uh, but also learn from our algorithms how the existing programs can be improved uh, to make them more successful. And eventually with the uh, vision that we have, uh, our goal is to bring these therapies to patients you know, faster a day, much you know, lower cost than it's happening today. Great. <clears throat> Thank you, Mrs. Cosset. And you, you mentioned uh, your closing statement on bringing therapies to patients faster and in a lower cost. And of course, right. this is a great, let's say, initiative and a great effort. And I think that uh, Mr. Saridakis, who is the founder of Collaborate Healthcare, another startup in the healthcare space, I think he is also trying to address the same problem. And uh, Mr. Saridakis, what do you think about the, the future of healthcare through technology and how is this relevant to what you do in your company? So hi everyone, uh, thank you for the invitation. This is an extremely important question and I can start by saying that the most reliable way to predict the future is to create it, as Abraham Lincoln had said in the past. So Collaborate is actually a specialized clinical application that uh, helps medical professions prevent, manage and treat effectively patients with chronic conditions through uh, better diagnostic and communication workflows. We, we've seen over the past decades uh, life-altering advancements in medical diagnostic testing and treatment options. And also we've seen the dramatic acceleration in the adoption of digital health services during the pandemic. But despite this progress, the healthcare industry, unfortunately, is still struggling in many areas, in many areas and still faces significant challenges. Uh, if we take, uh, for example, uh, a closer look to the most important industry KPIs, we can see that these are an imperative need for further improvement. Uh, as you know, uh, medical errors are still, the uh, uh, still causing thousands of preventable deaths each year, and it is actually the third leading cause of death behind cardiovascular diseases and cancer. And, and let me elaborate on this because it's extremely important. Uh, as we said, uh, we have very accurate diagnostic tools like the MRI and CT products of G Healthcare, for example. But, you know, research reveals that in around 5 to 7% of cases in hospitals, the result of a diagnostic examination fails to reach the patient. And th this is shocking if you consider the, how many millions of exams we have on a daily basis. And you understand also that in some cases, the, the results include life threatening findings. And why this is happening? You know, the answer is simply because the information is lost within the hospital communication chain. And another great example is the poor adherence to care plans. Uh, companies like Pfizer deliver a new amazing life-saving treatment options almost on a daily basis, yet thousands of patients die uh, simply because they didn't uh, follow the, the prescriptions uh, by their doctors. And I could go on and note, but to cut the long story short, the medical care delivery process is a change. And, and you know, a change is as strong as its weakest link. We have some very strong links, but unfortunately, we have some very weak links that have to do primarily, primarily with the communication and collaboration workflows, and especially with the ones related uh, to the informa information gathering and exchange, uh, error detection, and, and, and patient follow-up as Collaborate is, is at the moment trying to address these issues. So here where uh, technology companies like, like us, like startups can really help. We, we need to develop modern technology solutions to help address all, all these uh, missing gaps in the, in the care delivery process, process and to really facilitate the, the seamless and secure flow of clinical data among platforms and ecosystems, you know, which is required if we want to support coordinated uh, patient pathways and to unlock the true power of uh, new technology advancements such as AI and genome sequencing. And this will be even more important as we move forward to the future, because the, the true digital transformation is just starting and we really need to facilitate these new needs with modern technology. Let me give you another example on, on how the future will look like. Uh, today, as we see, as, as we speak in, in the US, there is a patient facility that has more than 300 medical professionals, yet they have zero patients. And how do they do that? because they provide care to patients uh, either at home or uh, to patients that are distributed in uh, 40 partner hospitals across the US. So actually this care facility coordinate care services like an air traffic control tower control airplanes. And you can't expect a modern care facility like this to work properly 
uh, without the appropriate technology. And this is actually how hospitals are going to look in the future. You know, ho hospitals will not be bricks and mortar facilities anymore, but rather interconnected networks that blend digital and physical services. And the reach will extend across healthcare facilities to persons' homes, uh, to retail malls, and to areas that are currently underserved by healthcare. You know, simply stated, for example, you could be driving your car and you could be monitored at the same time in real time by a doctor who is thousands of miles away. Uh, so to sum up, in this, in this scope, technology is extremely important to the future of healthcare and especially the technology that the startups can bring in uh, because startups, by definition, focus on, on the existing unaddressed problems so they can really strengthen these weak links, as, as I said before, uh, to truly uh, unlock the potential uh, that digital transformation can bring into the industry. Great. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Kostas. And uh, you talked a lot about the future and the future state of hospitals, healthcare, etc. And uh, I would really, really appreciate the opinion of uh, Professor Panayotis Vlamos on this, because as we know, academia is teaching the new people and therefore building the future. And I would like to have his opinion on, on this, on the future of healthcare and the transformation that can happen through technology. Yes, thank, uh, thank you very much for the honor of being in this very interesting panel and also for the nice questions raised. Uh, I represent I'm the scientific director of bioinformatics and human electrophysiology lab at the Department of Informatics of Union University. And uh, mainly there we develop uh, applications and tools that can be used in the way that uh, the panelists uh, already talked, and especially Mr. Saridakis. Uh, what we mainly do is uh, we utilize bioinformatics methods and digital health tools and perform research towards precision medicine approach for prevention and treatment strategies that take individual variability into account. This is the main core of what we are doing. And also, this will make the interconnection with uh, the purpose of having a different uh, type of uh, hospital or services uh, that uh, can be uh, given from the hospitals in the new era that we are entering. So our main target is to translate precision medicine outcomes into clinical settings. And uh, we do that through the seamless integration of data from clinical evaluation, from biomedical investigation with genomics and other physiological profiling but we aim to characterize an individual past patient's disease project progression. So the main core is to have uh, one direction, which is by, by biomarkers-oriented profile and mainly digital biomarkers-oriented profiles. Uh, we have implemented several examples in various chronic diseases, and this showed us that uh, integrating multi-level data improves our understanding of the onset and progression of a disease, and also give us the exact variation between individuals, illness and wellness phenotypes. And also, we also see the frailty function at, uh, at a very high level of uh, stability. Uh, with, what we mainly see now is that uh, the, the gold mine of uh, our era, which is uh, data, exists. Uh, the current data collection systems accumulate large amount of unintegrated and unstandardized data yet. Uh, most healthcare organizations have a wealth of those data. Uh, they could use them to improve their procedures and business practices, but they may, might not have the tools or expertise to uncover insights in that data. I think uh, Exactly, this is uh, the point that successful uh, examples like uh, the one of uh, Mr. Saridakis and Mrs. Kose come to uh, the scene. Uh, all these newer technology, cloud platform, big data analytics and AI tools are used, but uh, we have to uh, see a lot of things about that. Uh, you cannot uh, tra really treat a large amount of uh, data with uh, any tools from a bioinformatician like us with uh, uh, having not further uh, uh, from the beginning classification and uh, evaluation of uh, those data exactly and the profiling that I have told you. 
So uh, the vision we are trying to approach is uh, approaching three main directions uh, in healthcare, and this is done uh, eventually through technology and uh, informatics, and especially bioinformatics. The one is uh, what we call by biomarkers-oriented profile. Uh, this will give us the classification we need uh, towards precision medicine for the people according to the mechanism of an illness. The second is to uh, adapt and align those with the best practice uh, practices that exist worldwide in treatment. Uh, this can be done easily through translational research that we're performing. And the third, which is very difficult, is also to make the matching with drug repurposing, which is another huge uh, uh, chapter in what sh that should be done. Great, thank you very much for these insights. So in the meantime, uh, while you were speaking, I have more than 10, 15 questions from the audience. And this is great because it shows great engagement and technology connects us. Unfortunately, you cannot see the questions. I can only see them. And I think I will try to put a, a question in the topic that could address two or three of them together. And um, so the first thing I would like to, to discuss is, do you feel that the use and the need for technology in healthcare has arisen uh, since the pandemic? And I know that the state, and when I mean the state, I mean uh, Greece, uh, EU, probably US, I don't know about US, has allocated significant amount of funds to invest towards this direction. But do you also see this rise of healthcare technology and if of uh, technology in health? And if this is the case, would we expect to need uh, more roles in healthcare of people who have an engineer in data science, uh, engineers in data science, data scientists? AI professionals, 3D animations, all of these new era information technology experts um, in healthcare. Um, I, I would appreciate your, your opinion on that. And uh, we can start with Mr. Uh, Vlamos and then uh, feel free to join in this discussion and share your opinion. Uh Thanks for coming again to me. <laughs> uh, but uh, what I would like to start is, I will start from what we think that it's the, the crucial and main problem from my point of view. I think this can be described in a sentence. Uh, the sentence is lack of interoperability and data sharing. What the pandemic uh, started to, to break, to change, was exactly the data sharing and a part of this interoperability. Uh, what we know is that health data has always been challenging to access and share in a secure manner. We know that. The nature of health data creates a paradox. It's difficult to share because it's sensitive, requires a high level of privacy and security, yet the inability to access it when it's needed has potential to cause significant harm. A lack of interoperability can result in an incomplete understanding of an individual's or population health needs, which can lead to poorer outcomes and higher costs. This was exactly the case for me until, uh, I think, uh, one year before the pandemic. Uh, what we have seen is that uh, the change of uh, data sharing, uh, starting as a need from Mar March 2020, uh, has started earlier. Uh, it was the time that uh, clinical trials, uh, that uh, also uh, IQVIA is uh, doing with uh, a lot of uh, esteemed colleagues that we know, uh, has started to, to uh, state that we need uh, data from the biomarkers included in clinical trials. This, got, this is crucial. So imagine two things. One, that we had the data of these biomarkers for clinical trials for the last 20 years described somewhere, 
and uh, potentially integrated in a larger database system uh, in uh, our times. And secondly, uh, to have a system of interoperability of those data, of course, pseudonymized with the GDPR compliance, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But imagine that we could have them. So, what uh, the doctors uh, could have, the, the whole uh, health system could have, could have a, 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 an accurate pro profiling of what has been done and when it has been leading us towards a disease. So, this is my main remarks on, on your question. Okay, and uh, and uh, Mr. Gikas, besides the data themselves, which of course they are the new oil or whatever, a, a treasure for the society, what about the actual, let's say, engineering and the actual, you know, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, things that go besides the data? How how things have changed after the pandemic? And what type of new professions are you looking for in your organization? And how do you see the trend in the future? Okay, this is, uh, this is uh, thank you for giving me the, um, the floor after Professor Vlamos because I was quite inspired by what he, uh, he said. In fact, uh, the key, the dominant concept in, in this discussion is data and data is now everywhere. We are working on, on data and this is, and this that was very evident during the pandemic because in fact, uh, the interoperability was so evident. We have been working uh, about data analytics in GE in other businesses because GE healthcare is part of GE uh, where we have energy power and aviation. And for years, all of us, potentially we don't know, but uh, our jet engines that fly in our aircrafts, they send data all the time to, to command centers. And those are, are analyzed and provide the feedback and inputs to you on, on the go. So why we cannot do that with uh, in, in healthcare? Obviously we do. and. Practically, we have created command centers in many hospitals abroad where all that are, are, con are connected, uh, collected, analyzed, and provide uh, uh, through AI applications uh, input for the management, both at operational level, as I said, but also uh, uh, clinical level. So obviously, as it was very well said before, data is are precious, but we need to use applications and engineering methods to uncover the insights, as it was said, to, to make those data meaningful information. When it comes to pure uh, technology, I, I, I need to mention that uh, in GE, we spend more than 1 billion uh, per year in R&D. And uh, we have created more than 11,000 patents and we, we spend a lot in order to produce smarter machines. Uh, what we are looking for in, uh, in a company like ours, which is uh, imaging and uh, critical care uh, technology, we are looking to make uh, those systems safer. So we're looking to reduce uh, the dose to make this, uh, the, uh, to, to make sure that we have patient comfort. So we, in, on the hardware, what we're looking is to have uh, a faster and safer uh, provision of healthcare. And indeed, uh, engineering is giving us a lot of uh, new innovations on that side as well. And that's why with the help of the hardware and the analytics, what we can achieve, we can achieve what we call pro uh, healthcare provision in a care pathway. So now we are not discussing about just uh, uh, treating a disease, but making sure providing care to a patient in a, in a care pathway. It might be oncology, it might be cardiology, it, but it will be from prevention up to treatment and monitoring. And there is no way to achieve that unless we put all those technologies that we can produce to work together complementary, seamlessly, and having data uh, as, as the bridge, as the glue, to make sure that the information that comes out from the systems is meaningful and useful. This is the way uh, we work, and these are the roles that we are looking for, roles that can be engineers, but with a holistic approach into the technology. 
clear. And um, th thank you for this insight and also bringing engineering also with data. I, I, love, I love engineering and I also love data. So combining those is very interesting for me. Uh, and Mrs. Uh, Cosse, as I said, I have a lot of questions and there are two questions which I think are relevant to what the other um, panelists just said and also these two questions. The first is, do you believe that these new technologies can help reduce the cost of drugs? That's the first question. And the second is, do you believe at the same time from a different person that uh, AI is probably the most important and most, let's say, disruptive technology nowadays? And uh, I'm asking you because you're relevant to data, to improvement of clinical trials, which relate significantly to the cost of a drug, and also to AI, because this is what you, your company is doing. Thank you very much. Uh, I also want to thank Mr. Gikas and Professor Vlamos. They really synthesized so well and it was very insightful. Uh, to the questions, I absolutely believe uh, that's what keeps us going. Uh, the whole 80 people company that we are, we are all centered around that belief that uh, the power of uh, you know the data that we can actually use right now uh, with the power of uh, data science and machine learning algorithms um, and we definitely have that hope uh, and belief that drives us uh, not only the cost, but also the time, right? Uh, we believe that our technology, along with other technologies that are uh, pioneering right now, uh, we do have a chance to uh, curb the time cost uh, curve of uh, clinical developments. Um, so I'm hopeful and I'm also very excited about this question because it's very, very important and it's actually an existential question for a lot of companies like us. Um, I think the other question was, um, uh, could you please repeat the other question uh, related to? Yes, the other question was whether you believe uh, AI is the most disruptive ah. um, technology within what is happening right now. Right. Um, I don't know if I could go to the length to say the most disruptive. Uh, or the but, most important. But definitely up there, one of the most important uh, tools that we have. Um, and, uh, you know, pandemic actually, uh, maybe I'll be answering the other question that you asked earlier as well, uh, heightened uh, the attention and interest in healthcare. And in a way showed us that things could be accelerated if we all come together uh, towards a common mission and to solve a you know, life-threatening problem. Uh, so all of this is now bringing us to an inflection point, if it hasn't already, where we have uh, the tools that we didn't have before. We are now at a point to recognize and appreciate their value. Uh, we have insurmountable amount of data um, and uh, we are very clear on the problem statement. We all would like you know, the drugs and therapies to get to the patients faster, to reduce the burden on the patients as well as, you know, pharmaceutical and biotech companies. Uh, and AI definitely plays a significant role in making this uh, vision a reality. Um, in terms of, uh, uh, Mr. Gikas answered this really well, uh, engineers, data scientists, in general scientists, you know, uh, as a company, we say people are at the core of what we do, and uh, that's absolutely right. Uh, it's really these great minds uh, who know their, uh, you know, verticals, uh, who are great engineers, data scientists, machine learning experts uh, are going to help all of us to drive this, you know, quote unquote, revolution forward. Great, thank you very much. And uh, another question uh, we have here from the audience, and I would probably address this to Mr. Saridakis, is um, there is the feeling in Greece that the digital healthcare has been delayed. I mean, in other countries, we hear things happening earlier or that have happened earlier, maybe 10 years ago, things like electronic patient records, uh, things like that. What is your view on that? Why do you think this is the case, if this is the case? And how do you see us moving forward? Can things be improved or uh, fast forward, if I may? Yeah, actually, this is an amazing question. And I can uh, verify that uh, in Greece, we do have a delay in, in the adoption of this kind of solutions. But I can assure you that this is mainly a global problem uh, because, you know, Healthcare's, healthcare's biggest problem is perhaps processes. 
uh, and workflows. Uh, the, at the moment, the industry is highly fragmented. It, it, it is based on uh, legacy uh, healthcare systems and it has legacy reimbursement uh, schemes. So actually, we do have the technology, but we don't have the appropriate uh, usage incentives or, or we don't have the appropriate policies uh, to accelerate the adoption. Uh, let me give you a, a real example from, uh, from our startup. Uh, if you go to, today to a Greek public hospital to, to sell uh, technology services, probably the only way they have to buy from you is through a tender process. The, you know, they, they are used to uh, make these big, uh, lengthy uh, tenders that take uh, many months and they cost, you know, really thousands of uh, uh, euros, hundreds of thousands of euros. But as a company, we provide our service on, on a SaaS basis on a monthly subscription fee, let's say 50 euros per month by using the credit card. So... If we go to a hospital, they can't really buy from us. They, 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 literally, they, they cannot buy from us. They don't have the processes and the tools to, to adapt in this new uh, business model. And also, uh, again, in, in, in this matter, uh, doctors and patients don't have the right in, incentives to use all these tools. And, and we need to rethink the, the current reimbursement uh, policies. Uh, let me give you an example that we don't have, unfortunately, here in Greece. In Germany, it is the first country that actually reimburses the digital health applications for mental health. This is a, 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 an extremely uh, important milestone in the health delivery. And another example comes from the US where doctors actually get a success fee when uh, patients uh, comply to medication. And uh, we need this kind of incentives, uh, these new innovative reimbursement policies in order to help the, the, the system accelerate this, this solution. So at the end, I can say that the problem is not the lack of the technology, but the lack of innovation in, in workflows and, and policy decisions. Well, thank you very much. And uh, your, your answer links to the, new, to the next question we have here from, uh, and from the audience. So you, you painted the situation in Greece kind of black-ish, right? Not black, but black-ish. And the, the next question is, do you believe that there are opportunities uh, for young uh, graduates of information technology or technology to work in the field of health in Greece or better to look abroad? And maybe someone said, look, Greece is not good in this uh, in this area and maybe it's worth looking abroad. Uh, my personal opinion is that <clears throat> in Greece nowadays, there is, let's say, an orgasm of investment in healthcare and technology. Uh, not only from Greek com from companies who look at Greek internally, but also for, from a lot of companies who look uh, to export. So big multinationals like Pfizer, which has invested in Thessaloniki, smaller startups like Intelligentsia that hires people here in Greece, uh, other companies like uh, Collaborate, uh, who's doing this, uh, Academia, who probably builds things um, and probably exports them across the world as ideas or as concepts. And because we only have, let's say, five extra minutes, I would really appreciate a short comment of one minute from each of you to explain to this gentleman who asked this question why it's worth staying in Greece, if, of course, he wants, and why he should feel that there is a future for him as an IT professional, an IT engineer in Greece in the healthcare sector. And uh, may I start again alphabetically, just to close as we started. Mr. Gigas. Well, you, you said very well. Uh, healthcare has been uh, demonstrated as a huge infrastructure for uh, everywhere thanks to the pandemic health is the right field to to be the need is is here is evident and we have a lot of room to to to, to make things in digital uh, space in data analytics and ov obviously uh, the talent is here we have a lot of talents and everybody realizes that the point is that we give them the opportunity and the framework as it was said very well from uh, mr Seridakis. To, to, to deploy its talent in the country. And there are problems that ca has to do with, uh, um, you know, more, more or less with the bureaucratic ways that we operate in the country. We 
look like we have made a decision to move forward on this. And I think this is the right space to, to stay and work. Yes, thank you for this. Um, so thank you for this optimistic view. I also agree on that. Mrs. Cosset. Yeah, I would like to build upon that as well. Um, I have to say, as an outsider, I'm very impressed by the amount of appetite and investment Greek ha Greece has been making in the last you know, handful of years to um, you know, create an environment that fosters you know, innovation and attracts talent. That's part of the reason we have an office. Our biggest R&D office is actually made out of Athens. Uh, I spend significant amount of time happily in Athens. Uh, there's a there's an unparalleled uh, talent pool, uh, and it is uh, our job. You know, companies of uh, like Intelligentsia and GE, etc., our job to create an environment where we bring in the same uh, opportunities uh, to the talent in Greece. But I would also, uh, as an outsider, encourage for folks to first look at the opportunities uh, in Greece because they are. Uh, massively growing uh, as we look forward, which is encouraging. Thank you. Thank you for the positive message, and especially from an outsider. It's even more important because it's, let's say, I would say more objective if this yeah. That's correct, makes sense. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Saridakis, maybe a one minute comment from you and then from Professor Vlamos, and uh, just to, to respect also the time of the, the event. Yeah, I can definitely agree that now it's a very good time for people to pursue uh, job careers here in Greece. I can assure you that uh, investors uh, from the, the US uh, sees Greece as, an, uh, as a great place for R&D and most companies it's, uh, you know, place their R&D departments here in Greece and they uh, export services to big markets like the US. So this model really works. And uh, we do have a lot of uh, new investment funds, more than 10 funds investing in new startups. Uh, startups are getting better and then creating, you know, many really good uh, job, high quality job positions. And at the same time, we see a lot of companies, more and more companies, uh, like, for example, Pfizer, that they have invested in this amazing hub uh, that create the, the environment for, for people to, to start uh, these uh, promising and aspiring careers in, in the health tech uh, technology sector. So I, 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 I fully agree with your comment. Thank you. And uh, Professor Vlamos, what's your opinion? Yes, I, I think uh, the last years we have the private investments uh, who, who can uh, overpass the policies, uh, the policy decisions uh, problems. We have all the talented uh, graduates that uh, can build up uh, uh, all these uh, needed uh, places in the companies. And uh, I think we will soon have uh, also the money from RRF. There is an investment of more than 500 million uh, euros to promote exactly the digital transformation education, uh, but also mainly the health system. Uh, two directions uh, should be uh, pointed. One that uh, we should uh, focus on this uh, sentence, digital transformation of the health system. And the second, which is difficult, we have to build a comprehensive national public health problem, pro program, which will include the expansion of prevention services. I think these two, these two directions can absorb all the talented people that can work uh, in this field. Thank you very much, Professor Vlamos. Um, as, a, as a footnote on this great discussion, we are all here in this panel serving healthcare from different roles. So, other from academia, other from multinational, big multinational, other from startup, but clearly we're serving healthcare. And I would say that my feeling is that serving an industry as healthcare is probably the most um, reimbursing if the term is allowed because we're also talking about healthcare industry to serve because making people healthier, improving health is probably the most valuable industry to be. Of course, making stocks go higher, making machines run faster, making PCs be smarter, it's also good, but serving the human is, I would say, um, more fulfilling. And in this, in this industry, there's plenty of room for information technology and technology in general. 
And uh, for all of the audience, uh, I would really encourage you to follow such a path if you like it. Um, having said that, I would like to thank all of the people in this um, discussion, Mr. Gikas, Mrs. Kose, Mr. Saridakis, Professor Lamos. It was very nice talking to you. It was an honor. I learned a lot of things from you. Thank you very much. Well, Enjoy many, the afternoon many, and have a nice weekend. Many, many thank thanks you. for the night. Nice thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.